Amen and good morning, Freedom Church. Uh, visitors, again, just want to take a second and welcome you. If it's your first time with us, uh, just glad to have you. My name's Clint, a lead pastor. One of the elders, I don't do all the preaching and teaching, but do most of it. Uh, but we are led by a plurality of elders, a group of guys that lead the church um, together. And, uh, and so my role is, again, often doing most of the preaching and teaching, not all of it. Uh, but we all uh, serve and lead together. So again, on uh, behalf of the elders, on behalf of uh, members of Freedom Church, to the visitors, I want to take a second and welcome you and thank you for being here. If you've got your Bibles, flip to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We'll be, uh, be continuing this series, Life Over the Sun. Um, and, uh, and if you're, if you're new, uh, Ecclesiastes is a rather intense book, an intense look at life. Uh, consistently, the author uses this phrase, under the sun. And by this phrase, under the sun, he means apart from God. And so this great uh, preacher, Koheleth, uh, in the Hebrew, uh, is, has been talking to us and teaching us. It could be Solomon, uh, his own words. It could be somebody speaking on behalf of Solomon's experience. But basically, the richest, wisest uh, um, kind of most successful, uh, most knowledgeable, most material things, most women, uh, kind of person who had everything you could have ever wanted apart from God underneath the sun. This man is speaking, and he's saying, let me tell you what I've learned uh, un about life underneath the sun. And so we've been in this series together at Freedom. We, we, we think it wise to preach straight through books of the Bible uh, so that we, we go to the hard passages and deal with all that God has said uh, in his word and believe that he's wise and how he's, he's uh, inspired and written it. And so we do that together. We'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter 6 beginning in verse 10. Uh, we'll go through 7 14 this morning. Now I want to start by telling you how we came up with the title Life Over the Sun. So again throughout the book uh, the phrase is under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. Uh, but we titled the series Life Over the Sun. And this is why a uh, song written by Shane and Shane called Over the Sun. Uh, and I think they set up kind of the interaction uh, with the preacher of Ecclesiastes very well. Uh, and, they, and the song begins the first verse is sitting around the fireplace with a friend who's been through it all. Solomon, wisest one, tell me what you have found. So they set up this scene, sitting around the fireplace with a friend who's been through everything. Solomon, wisest one, tell me what you have found under the sun. And then he replies, get over, get over, get over the sun, get over, get over, get over the sun where life is hidden. So Solomon, the wisest one who knows it all under the sun, says, get over the sun where life is hidden. And so we've titled this series, uh, Life Over the Sun. Now we finished last week about halfway through the book, uh, and Lord willing, we'll go through the end of, of next month. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, we'll take December off uh, for an Advent series through the book of Ruth we're excited about. And then we'll jump in January in Ecclesiastes and finish up uh, this book in January. But what you need to know right now in this transition, we finished about halfway through the book, and, and the, the preacher's been a little bit on this experiment with us that we've talked about. But he's going to make a little bit of a transition, and I, and I need to give you a little bit of um, just kind of a fair warning. We're dealing with ancient wisdom literature, uh, and so the communication style is not often the way we think. And so this morning, even the text we're going to look at can seem a little disjointed, like how does all this fit together? Uh, the middle section of uh, the text this morning is actually going to be different Proverbs, so just different sayings. And if you've ever read the book of Proverbs, you know that sometimes those sayings can be totally disconnected from another because the, the wise teacher is just giving you nuggets of wisdom, okay? And so as we transition now to the second half of this book, we'll get a little more of kind of lots of thoughts combined uh, together rather than one kind of um, just obvious and clear argument, though I think there is a argue, uh, clear argument this morning. Here's your big idea. Here's your big argument, your big thought this morning. So again, if you, if you're, if you like music, which I haven't met a human being who doesn't like some sort of music, the hook, the chorus, uh, there's often a, a, a hook or chorus about a song that sticks in your mind that describes and summarizes the song. The chorus or the hook are the main point this morning. We do not know what is best for us. Therefore, we should live with wisdom and joy while trusting in the sovereign God who does. We do not know what is best for us. Therefore, we should live with wisdom and joy while trusting in the sovereign God who does. Let's pray together and we'll jump in. Father, we come before your holy word now, needing to hear from you, believing uh, that you have inspired this word through your Holy Spirit and that your Holy Spirit loves to guide us into truth and your word is truth. So Holy Spirit of the living God, speak. We are listening. For your great glory in Jesus' name, amen. So we do not know what is best for us. Look at chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. The preacher begins, he says, Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is that, that advantage to man? 
For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? So the preacher begins with themes that we've covered and he's talked about already up to this point when he basically says, um, whatever has come to be has already been named. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 10, chapter 3, verse 15. There's nothing new under the sun. So he, he begins by reminding us, remember what I've taught you. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing that hasn't been. And, and so just know the treadmill of life continues on. This is what he begins to tell us. Yesterday, I don't know if some of you guys may, uh, may have saw, I tweeted out uh, a tweet. I said, parents, spend more effort getting your children to trust what you say and then getting them to do what you say will be a healthier process. So if as parents, we spend more effort getting our children to trust what we say then getting them to do what we say will be a healthier process. I tweeted this out because uh, Noah, our 11-month-old, he was crawling in the kitchen. Uh, Rachel was at a, at a, a ministry meeting uh, with women at the church. She was at a meeting, so I'm keeping the kids, and anytime that happens, I need lots of prayers. Um, you know, stay-at-home moms or heroes, I, I, would, I would lose. In like three hours, the kids would beat me, and the whole world would be upside down. But anyway, for a few hours, I can do it, right? So I'm keeping the kids, and Noah begins to crawl off uh, over beside the refrigerator. And beside the refrigerator, kind of in the corner, tucked away, we've got all our brooms and, and our mops and the dustpan and those kinds of things. So anytime Noah goes over there, we always tell him, no, sir, no, sir. So Noah starts to crawl over there, and I say to him, no, sir. And he turns and looks at me, and I said, no, sir. And he looked at me and went, <laughs> and just started shaking his head. And so he's processing what I'm saying to him. And he's like, this, I think, means I'm not supposed to do this. He smiles, and I can tell he's processing. I don't think he's being defiant. He's processing. What am, I, what am I supposed to do right now? I really want that dustpan. He's shaking his head no, but I want the dustpan. And so he goes to reach again. I said, Noah, no, sir. And he kind of looks up like, wait a minute, that voice was a little more firm. I'm a little alarmed by the volume, a little alarm, alarmed by, by the firmness in that sound. And he's kind of smiling at me. And so what I do is I go over, I pick him up, I, and I turn his back. Uh, to where the dustpan is and face him away. And then I walk away from him because I'm hoping to teach him, right? I don't want to just say don't do it and just move him. I'm actually teaching him to obey my words, right? So I don't just move him away and let him do it. It's like, no, no, I, I want him to get this, right? So he sits down, he kind of turns back and looks and I look at him and I say, Noah, come here, just come to daddy. Just come to daddy. And he begins to smile <clears throat> and he just starts crawling as fast as he can. And I pick my little man up and I hold him and I tell him, good boy, you can trust your daddy's words. Your daddy loves you. He knows what's best for you. You can trust his words. Come back to daddy. Right? So I say this to him. I speak this to him. This led me to think a lot about God as father and all that he's been teaching us in Ecclesiastes. Often we wanted just a bunch of rules like God to tell us, don't do that and do do this. When what God is after is that we can trust his words. And then we can believe and know this is a good father who's speaking good things to us, who gives good gifts. He knows what's best. God knows what's best for us, and so we can trust his words. And when we trust his words, we're more likely to follow and do what he's called us to do because we believe he's a good father, friends. But before we can trust his words, I have bad news for you. You have to distrust your own. Before you can begin to trust that God knows what's best, you must first distrust that you know what is best. Four reasons the preacher gives us to distrust our own words or our own thoughts to prove to us we do not know what's best. First reason, there's nothing new under the sun, right? So that's what he says in verse 10. Whatever has come to be has already been named. You're on the same treadmill of life that every human being has been before you. You're not any exception to any rule. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful, and with the temptation, he'll provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. You're not an exception to the rule. Your life is not unique in the least bit. We have to understand this. We're not the first human being to perfectly figure out God and to perfectly interpret our lives. We're on the exact same treadmill that every other human being has ever been on. And this God who is watching us, who knows us, has watched every second of human history. Matter of fact, he's predestined that it might be. So he knows better than we. We don't know what's best. He knows what's best. This is why Psalm 94 for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. 
For God, a thousand years is a day, a day is a thousand years. So this moment in time that you exist in is not a unique one. He's seen them all. And so we first have to understand there's nothing new under the sun. So therefore, we should distrust our own opinion or thought when we believe our experiences are unique experiences to us alone. It's like there's nothing new under the sun, friends. The pain you're going through, the joy you're going through, the temptation you're going through, the excitement you're going through, the difficulty you're going through, whatever you're going through has been gone through by people before you, is going, people going through it right now, and people will in the future. There's nothing new underneath the sun. You should distrust your own opinion of what is best. Second reason you should distrust your opinion of what's best. Because God wins all arguments because he's over the sun. Therefore, us who are under the sun arguing with him is dumb. He wins all arguments because he's over the sun and he sees it all. Therefore, you arguing with him is a very ignorant argument. You're going to lose. (laughs) You're under the sun. He sees it all, right? This is what the preacher goes on to say. Second half, verse 10. It is known what man is and that he's not able to dispute with one stronger than he, meaning God. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? Proverbs 21, verse 30 says, No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. You will never win an argument with God. You will never come up with something he didn't know. And he's like, oh, you got me on that one. I didn't think about that. He's like, I created the thought to be able to be in your mind in the first place. I breathed it. Come on, get out of here. You can't argue with God, right? Isaiah 45, woe to him who strives with him, who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making or your work has no handles? So Paul picks this up in Romans 9. Like what right does the the, the potter or the the pot have to, to argue with the potter? He made you. He's the expert of you, not you. He formed you. So you don't get to say, hey, why are you forming me like that? I know a better way you could have formed me. He made you. You don't know anything better than him, right? This is the wise one. It's foolish for us to argue with somebody stronger than us. The preacher's already said this uh, back in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 when he said, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Because you're not telling him something he doesn't already know, right? It is foolish to argue with God. Arguing with God is ignorant. It reminds me, I was, when I was a kid, I was probably uh, five or six years old, and I was just kind of beginning to get my mind around how to read a clock. You know what I'm saying? The old school, the old school clock, right? Analog deal, not the digital one like that one back there. Reading the old school clock, and there's this video of me as a kid arguing with my father. And I'm like, Dad, it's 7 o'clock. He said, no, son, it's 7.30. I said, no, it's 7 o'clock. He said, it's 7.30. And I just keep arguing with him. Foolish argument. I'm a little kid. I'm learning how to read the clock. Dad's teaching me how to read the clock, but I'm arguing with the one who's teaching me how to read the clock. This is what it's like when we argue with God, except infinitely more ignorant. It's foolish when we argue with him. So do not trust yourself when you begin to argue with God. Thirdly, a reason to distrust yourself. You do not know what is good for you in your short life. Verse 12, for who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. So he says these few days, he asks the question, it's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is is not you, (laughs) not man, right? Who knows what's good for man in this vain short life that passes like a shadow? You ever try to get comfortable on the beach underneath one of those little umbrellas uh, and, and, and the sun's coming up and you're trying to sit under there and take a nap? But the problem is the sun moves so quickly in a small umbrella, like you can never, you got to keep picking the chair up and moving it, trying to stay with the shade, with the shadow. He's like, who can know what's best for him when his days are passing so quickly like a shadow? You don't know what's best for you. This is the question. You don't know what's good for you in your short past life. You don't know uh, how your life fits into the greater scheme uh, of redemptive history that God himself is the author of. Right? So he says, don't trust yourself because you don't know what's good for you. Then lastly, you don't even know the result. So not only do you not know what's good for you in your short life, you don't know the result. Second part of verse 12. For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? As he told us all throughout this book, you'll die and sooner than later be forgotten. Your stuff will be handed off to somebody that may lose it, may get rid of it, may waste it, who knows? And so he says, you don't even know what's gonna be after you. So you don't know what's best for your life now, and you don't even know what's gonna come after your life then. Friends, you're not an exception to the rule of life's treadmill. There's no reason to argue with God because you do not what is good for your short life, and you do not know what is gonna come after you. 
You're unable to see the big picture of your past, your present, and your future in the same way that God can see it. These are four reasons to distrust your opinion on what's best. So when he asks the question, who knows what is good for man while he lives? The quick answer is not you, not me, not us. <laughs> That's his whole point. Who knows what's best for us? Not us. No wonder the Bible compares us to sheep, right? Ignorant animals who don't know what's best for them. They wander off the side of a cliff. They wander off to wolves, wander off from the flock, right? This is why the scriptures refer to people as sheep often. We don't know what's best for us, but distrusting ourselves as ignorant sheep leads us to Jesus' words in John 10. And we're encouraged when we read and hear him say this. John chapter 10, verse 14. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, read the word sheep, hear sheep, think ignorant ones who do not know what's best for themselves. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. My sheep hear my voice like Noah can hear mine and trust mine. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We may be ignorant sheep, but the Lord Jesus came to call ignorant sheep to himself. We may not know what's best, but we know the King who calls and invites those who admit you do not know what's best to follow the one who is the good shepherd. You don't know what's good for your life, but Christ shows up and says, I am good for your life. Hear my voice, trust my voice, Follow me and I give you eternal life. So to Christians, I would just say we must admit we do not know what's best for our lives. But we do know who is best for our, our lives, the king. Non-Christian friends in the room, I just humbly ask you to consider your vantage point on, on earth. This vast earth in the vast spread of human history. Do you really trust you knew what's best for yourself? Do you really believe that? that you are the expert on your life. We would ask you even to consider following the good shepherd. So one, we do not know what is best. Number two, wisdom is better than folly. So uh, Koheleth, the preacher, reminds us that we do not know what is best, but now he's gonna encourage us to live in ways that, that are better than what is worst, all right? So he says, we don't know what's best for us. However, in this life underneath the sun, wisdom is better than folly. So we don't know what's best, but we do know what's better than what's worst. <laughs> wisdom is better than folly. So sitting by the fire with the old man who's teaching us and talking to us about what wisdom is like is kind of the moment we step into. So Solomon or, or the one writing behalf of Solomon is going to tell us, let me tell you in light of even though you don't know what's best, here's how to live a wise life. So don't swing the pendulum to where it's like, okay, we don't know what's best, so we, it doesn't matter what we do. No, 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 it matters what you do. Let's do, again, wisdom is better than folly. So he begins, verse 7, a good name is better than precious ointment. A good name is better than precious ointment. He begins by saying you should care a whole lot more about your reputation than you do your financial situation. A good name is better than fine ointment. You should care a lot more about your reputation than you do the, 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 like the status, the, the good things, the wealth uh, that you have, the things that you have, your name. Proverbs 22.1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold. A good name is to be chosen even over great riches. The way you guys have heard me say this, the way my father taught me this growing up was he would say to me, son, your reputation walks way out in front of you. Your reputation is way out in front of you. Way, it, it's walking way out there in front of you. It gets to people before you do. So I ask you, what is your reputation? Do you have a good name? What comes to people's minds when they think of you? Are you a person of integrity? Are you a person who's dishonest? Are you a person who works hard? Are you a person who's lazy? Are you, are you a person who cuts corners and cheats? Or are you a person who, who does things the right way? Are you authentic or are you a hypocrite? If someone was to ask your closest friends and family, what is he or what is she most passionate about? What would the answer be? If I ask your closest friends and family, what are you most passionate about? What would they tell me? What is your reputation? The wise man understands that his reputation today is built on the attitudes and actions of his past. 
The man's reputation today is built on the attitudes and actions of yesterday. And he understands that the reputation he will have tomorrow is built on the attitudes and actions of today. And so Solomon says to live a wise life, you need to understand a good name is better than good treasure. A reputation is better than having uh, material things. But notice what he says in the next several verses. He takes us into a very dark place very quickly because this is what the preacher does with us every week. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting for this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. So what is he saying in all this? So he says the day of death is better than the day of birth. Okay, hold on. This would, really? So would you rather A, go to the hospital and see new Jonah Smith, baby Jonah Smith born, and celebrate that moment, or would you rather go to a funeral? He says the day of death is better than the day of birth. He says the day of mourning is better than a day of laughing, or a day of, of feasting. And he says sorrow is better than laughter. What is he saying? He says it's, it's, it's better, let's summarize all, all of these verses together, it's better to be sorrowfully mourning at a funeral than it is to be laughing during a feast at a birthday party. What? You gotta ask questions when you read passages of scripture and it's like, I don't get that one. How is that better? How is it better to be sorrowfully grieving and mourning at a funeral than it would to be laughing and celebrating at a feast during a birthday party? How is this better? Why would he say that? Like, why is the preacher the ultimate party pooper? Because that's what he's doing right now, right? He's saying the party's not good. Actually, the grieving is good. Why would he say that? Why would he say it's better to be weeping at a funeral than celebrating at a party? Now, the answer is in the second part of verse 4, the end of verse 3, and then summarized in verse 4. Look at the, end, uh, the second part of verse 2. For this is the end of all mankind, so he says, we're all going to die. So the funeral, the death, this is the end of all mankind. And the living will lay it to heart. Death makes you ask very serious questions in your soul that you do not ask otherwise. At birthday parties, you don't ask questions about your soul. You don't ask questions about what matter eternally. You don't evaluate and think, am I wasting my life? When you're at a funeral, you wonder, am I living for the right things? There's a sobriety that says one day I will be in the casket. And on that day, will I look back with regret or up to that day with regret? Or will I have lived for the right things? And at the end of verse 3 says, by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. The, the word in Hebrew could be translated better. I think better seems to fit the context a little bit better. Um, sorry for the wordplay there. But I think he's saying, by sadness of face, the heart is made better. Your heart gets weighty. Your heart gets sober. Your heart asks the right questions when you have sad sadness of face. And then he summarizes in verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth, which just means amusement or laughter. Now, this word heart, what does it mean in the scriptures? We're not talking about, the, you know, the pretty red thing on Valentine's, right? That's not what heart is. Heart is the seat of of the emotions and the thoughts of, of a human being. It's the very core of who you are, right? And so in all of these, he's saying there's something that different that happens in the core of who you are when you are grieving and sorrowful at a funeral that does not happen in the core of who you are when you're celebrating and laughing at a party. There's something that goes on in the heart. The old sage sitting by the fireplace says death is better than birth because something profound happens in your heart that produces wisdom. Wisdom is produced in these moments when the heart is gripped in these moments. That's why the psalmist prays in Psalm 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Funerals make you number your days. Parties don't. And so he says, in these moments, there's an opportunity for wisdom for you to have. My eighth grade year, I met a kid named Lewis Markling. We became really good friends. Began talking on the phone every day because Lewis was already uh, smoking a lot of weed at the time. Lots of trouble, failing out of classes. He had a really terrible home life. Um, and so things were very difficult for him. And so he started calling me so that he wouldn't go smoke weed and get in trouble. Now, I'm an eighth grade dude. I don't talk on the phone to girls, let alone other dudes, right? So but we'd be on the phone every single night. And we would just talk about whatever. What girls or maybe homework, probably not as much as we should have. Um, and then every now and then I started thinking, you know what I'm going to do? 
hey, man, is it all right if I just read you some of these verses? And he would chuckle at me and kind of laugh like, yeah, man, whatever. My mom had this little book called Words of Wisdom full of some Proverbs and Psalms. And so I would pick them up. And I didn't know how to share the gospel. I didn't know anything about anything. I knew I loved Jesus. I knew this guy didn't know Jesus. And I'm like, well, I'll try to give him some Bible verses. And so I'd read them to him, and Lewis would kind of chuckle and laugh. and be like, thanks, man. But, yeah. Uh, so did you see that game? You know, and then we just kind of transitioned. I wouldn't know what to say. And we would do this kind of all, all throughout the year, our eighth grade year, talking on the phone every day. Well, then during the summer between eighth and ninth grade, um, Lewis uh, calls me twice, one time just to, to, to check in. The second time he calls me, and said, hey, man, I got to tell you something. I said, all right, what's up? He said, I just, I just went to church with a friend and I got saved. And you're the only, only person on the planet who would actually care or even know what I mean. And so I just wanted to tell you that. And I'm like, man, praise God. You know, like, I, I'm happy. I'm proud of you. I'm encouraged. And so we have this interaction. It's in, it's in August during that summer. Then we go into our freshman year of high school. I'm playing football. He gets a girlfriend. That means no phone conversations happening any longer. And then Thanksgiving week, we get out uh, for Thanksgiving week. This is 20 years ago, this Thanksgiving. We get out for Thanksgiving week. Monday, he calls me. He says, hey, man, I just want to tell you, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, and happy New Year. All right, man, you too. I hear people laughing in the background. I don't know if they were smoked up. I'm not sure what was going on, but I hear a lot of noise. He repeats himself four or five times. Happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Yeah, man, I just want to call and tell you, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. All right, you too, man. Hang up the phone, and it's like, it was just kind of a weird interaction. Tuesday, he's walking from that same church to a gas station. He gets hit by a car. He's in the hospital on Wednesday on life support, and they take him off life support, and he dies Thanksgiving morning. Now, as a freshman in high school who is beginning to be really successful at football, I'm beginning to get lots of, you got to live it up while you're in high school. You're going to be the quarterback. you got to get the girls. you got to do the party scene. Man, you gotta, you're only high school one time. Live it up, man. you got one shot. But friends, in that moment, it was better to be sorrowful, grieving as I looked in a casket at his swollen face that did not look like him and saw his body and realized he didn't move schools. He's gone forever, either to eternal paradise with God, which I believe, or to eternal torment underneath the wrath of God. And that brings a sobriety that says to me, no, the party scene is not just a fun thing right now. Life and death is real. And so when you're in that moment, Solomon says, pay attention because you ask hard questions and you begin to evaluate and think about life very differently. And if you're paying attention, you can gain wisdom. And wisdom grows in this moment. This is what Solomon is telling us. This is why he says the heart of wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the heart, uh, house of laughter or amusement. Think about our culture. We do everything to uh, avoid that pain. We, we, want, we do not want to look death in the face. We do not want to do it. The, uh, the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery reported Americans spent $12 billion in 2013 on plastic surgery. $12 billion, 2013. Let me tell you something. Every one of those bodies who got plastic surgery will lay in a casket at the exact same time irrelevant to their surgery. It won't add a second of life. But we don't, we don't want to look at death, so we'll get surgery to make it look like we're not getting on with dying. Friend, you're going to die. We will all die. We must face that or we will never have the wisdom Solomon is calling us to have. We will die. And so you can escape to drugs. You can escape to party. You can escape to sports. You can escape to moralism. You can escape to being successful. You can escape to, to gaining money and having a house and having kids. You're going to die either way. And so he says there's wisdom. We must face death because it leads to great wisdom. It leads us to live a life of joy with the gifts God has given to us. We don't just pass them by. We realize life is precious. It is short. We have today, and so we want to enjoy the gifts God has given today. The funeral home reminds us how precious life is and exhorts us to ev enjoy every second while living for the things that matter most. Next, the preacher tells us uh, the sting we feel, may, maybe even feel right now, right? Like you feel a little bit rebuked, like, Ugh, I don't like looking at death either. I'd rather just be a fool rather than a wise dude who looks at death. I'd rather be a fool who just keeps singing and partying. He goes in verse, verse 5 and says, It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. So he says, It's better to hear Solomon's rebuke than Timberlake's can't stop the feeling. <laughs> right? 
This is what he's saying. Like, and I love the song, right? So I, you guys know that I've already said it before. I love the song. But the song literally is kind of escaping from the pain and, and fragile nature of life into saying, let's just dance and enjoy the moment. But it's like, no, no, no. Look Solomon in his eyes. Hear from him what he's saying to you. It is better to hear rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. The preacher says, wisdom comes from having true friends that will rebuke you. If you only surround yourself with friends who affirm you, you're a fool surrounding yourself with fools. This is what he says. The wise man gets people more wise than him who will rebuke him and teach him what is right and wrong. And he learns from them. The foolish man is, I want to get everybody around me who would just affirm what it is I already want to do so I can keep being a fool and they can just be a fool too. Now, we don't think this way, but this is the way Solomon is speaking to us. And this is why our culture is so out of whack. Because we, we've redefined love as unconditional affirmation detached from objective truth. Our culture has said love is unconditional, I affirm you, no matter what you say. Detach it from ob objective truth. Love is affirmation. Friends, that is not true. It is not true. That's foolishness. That is folly. For someone to be dying and going to hell because of a particular sin and for you to say that sin's good for you, it's okay, enjoy it, is to say to them, enjoy your way to hell. That's not love. It's foolish. No, the wise man says, I want you to rebuke me when you see me in error. The foolish man just wants to be affirmed. The wise man says, please come and rebuke me where you see me in error. Proverbs 12, 1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. That's a Bible verse. So if you're offended, I'm, I, I don't know, what do you mean to do? It's a Bible verse. You hate to be reproved. You are stupid. That's what the verse says. Now, it's just funny because if we all are honest, we all are stupid. Because <laughs> we hate to be, I, nobody likes like, man, I just love it when somebody tells me how ignorant I am. <laughs> I love it when somebody tells me I'm in sin. Nobody enjoys that. Why? Because we're foolish. And we need to realize, God protect me from myself. We need those who would rebuke us. Verse 6, he goes on and says, For as the crackling of thorns are in our pot, so is the laughter of fools. This is also vanity. So he says the fool laughs at all this serious talk we're having right now. He's not interested. Ah, you guys are serious. So the fool is tuning me out right now. Like, ah, I'm not interested in this. This, this is what Solomon says. He, he's, he's like the crackling thorns underneath a pot. In the verse 7, surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. Now the preacher is going to warn those whom have acquired wisdom to continue to fight for wisdom and to fight against folly. As he taught us in previous passages, power underneath the sun is often abused. So when you get authority, you get power, you often abuse that authority and power in life underneath the sun. But not only the oppressed, but the oppressor is also tempted to take new bribes to get more and more money. So you're oppressed, that drives you nuts and that'll drive you away from wisdom into folly. But then the oppressor, the one in power, you might get bribed to get a bigger platform and more money, more influence, and that'll drive you away from wisdom into folly. And so he says, no matter if you're on top or if you're on the bottom, you need to know you'll be tempted to leave wisdom and to go to folly. The temptation will be different and it'll be set up just perfectly for you. So if you're at the top or if you're at the bottom, know that you are uniquely going to be tempted to leave wisdom and to go towards folly. The more difficult the oppression, the stronger the temptation to fly off the handle. The more wrongly you're treated, the greater the temptation for you to lose your mind. And the bigger the platform, the bigger the temptation to abandon wisdom for yet a bigger platform. This is what he tells us. And so he warns us. We've got to counter that temptation by remembering, verse 8. We counter that temptation by remembering better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So he says we should not rush to judgment. The wise man knows that his current experience is a tree in the midst of a lifetime of forests. So the wise man doesn't rush to judgment in the moment, whether he's at the bottom or whether he's at the top. No matter the temptation, he knows this is a current tree in my life, but my whole life is, is a massive forest. And so therefore, I'm going to remember there's an end in mind. And I'm not going to freak out in this moment as if the end's not coming. I'm going to keep my calm. It's better to be patient in spirit than proud in spirit. Because I see and understand the end is better than the beginning. What does this mean for us? It means being impatient goes hand in hand with pride and foolishness. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you're impatient, pride, foolish. Proud, foolish, impatient. These things go hand in hand together. 
You fight impatience by remembering you're in process and you're not yet at the end of your current experience. That's how you fight your impatience. You remember, I'm in process and I'm not to the end yet. I'm not to the end. And so he goes on, verse nine. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry for anger lodges in the heart of fools. An angry man is not a wise man. An angry man is a foolish man. That's what he says. If you're an angry man, you are a foolish man. This is what Solomon says, which probably makes you angry. But friend, that would make you more foolish. <laughs> right? So he says, an angry man is a foolish man. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry for anger lodges in the heart of fools. So just a quick exhortation. Don't make important decisions or statements in the midst of anger. That's foolish. In the midst of an angry moment, to say something or to make a decision to do something, that's an ignorant decision. You should cool off first. You'll regret it. You, more than likely, in moments of anger, you make decisions, you say things you will regret and need forgiveness for later. The Lord Jesus comments on this, right? Matthew chapter 5. He says, you say don't commit murder or you'll be liable to the judgment of hell. And he says, I say to you, anger in your heart leaves you liable to the same judgment. And so Jesus says, look, the murderer, yes, deserves judgment. So does the man who's angry in his heart. So Jesus speaks towards anger with great conviction. Proverbs 12, 16, the vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. Sidney Gradena says, fools nourish their anger until it, it explodes. Friends, don't nourish anger in your heart. Confess it. Go to the one you're angry at. Ask for forgiveness. Say, I'm angry in my heart, and, and it's a sinful, and I'm sorry. Will you forgive me and help us work through the issue and conflict that we have? Otherwise, you nourish the anger and bitterness in your heart, and it will explode. Next, he goes after all of us in the next one. This is going to be fun. <laughs> Some of us more than others. Verse 10. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Uh-oh. What's he doing right here? He's going after nostalgia, right? Back in the good old days. So just in general, the older you are, the more tem tempting this one is, just by the nature of there's more days back there to look back at, right? Um, for the not as young people. There's nobody old in this room. So there's not as young people, right? You have more days to look back on and remember those days. But he, what does he say literally? He's like, don't look back and say, why were former days better than these? That's a dumb question. You're like, no, 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 I've been taught there's no such thing as a dumb question. The wisest man in the world disagrees with you. <laughs> he says it's a dumb question. Don't ask the question, for it's not from wisdom that you ask this question. Now, do you know why he would say this? Why is nostalgia such a problem for us? Because we tend to look back on those days and remember the good of those days. And we tend to forget the bad that was going on during those days. And so in the moment when we say, why are these days currently not as good as those days? We're looking at the bad in these days and ignoring the bad in those days, ignoring the good in these days and only looking at the good in those days. And so this is the great problem with nostalgia. We tend to, to, we tend to forget the bad of the good old days. It's a common trait in dying churches. If you go to every dying church and do some surveying, I guarantee you have people at that church saying we want it to be like it used to be. And that church will keep dying. And, in, and even in some ways, and I, now just to be clear, I love lovable Lincolnton. But in some ways, this is a very similar trait to small dying towns. Particularly if towns like ours were built on, on mills who are no longer there. And so there's this like, I want to go back to then. It's like, but mills don't exist anymore. So we can never go back to then. We have to figure out new ways to do new life in this town, right? And so he says, be careful when you look back with nostalgia. Now, even in, in Lincolnton, there's a guy who takes a lot of pictures of downtown Lincolln from 50s, 60s, 70s. I love those pictures. I love old cars. I love old buildings getting restored. I live in a house that was built in 1871. I love old things, right? So this one actually gets in my face a little bit more than maybe you would anticipate. But I love old things. But it's interesting. We see those old pictures, and often I think there's a building down here with the pictures on it. It's like, man, we just want to get downtown Lincoln back to the way it used to be. It's interesting to say that. I'd say I would love for it to be hustling, bustling with old nice 57 Chevys out there. That would be great. However, do you know I sat on my front porch, an African-American friend of mine who's about 65 years old, and he told me about some of those old days from his vantage point. He told me about the first African-American class to get uh, segregated into the high school. So Brown, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, but North Carolina schools didn't actually segregate until 70, 71. And he was in that first class, and he said, Clint, there were, there were nine of us, nine African-Americans in that first class. Tears start welling up in his eyes. And he says, and I remember blacks weren't allowed on Main Street. We had to walk down side streets because we weren't allowed on Main Street. And we went to school and coming out of football camp, he starts describing, remember the Titans? 
Right? He says, we went to school out of football camp. At camp, everything went great. We go to school. The first day, fights are breaking out everywhere. And I'm afraid I'm going to get hung from the balcony in the lunchroom at Lincoln High School. Tears in his eyes. He's telling me the story. So, friends, we can look back to this street bustling and nice and beautiful and love that, but not remember these days. Now, why, is this, why would he tell us this is a dumb question to say, don't say I like the former days? Why would he say this? Because the former days were life under the sun, just like this day is life under the sun and just like those days will be life under the sun. And life under the sun, money, sex, power, success, American dream, never satisfies. The good things back then were good gifts from God that he gave to be enjoyed. The good things today are good gifts from God that he gave to be enjoyed. The good things in the future will be good gifts from God. But friends, life underneath the sun apart from God will always be empty and fleeting. So he says, don't look back and ask that question. Verse 11, wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. An advantage of a knowledge is the wisdom that preserves the life of him who has it. So in verse 11 and 12, he wraps up this general kind of proverbs about wisdom. Um, and he says, those who see the sun, meaning those who are alive, it's good for you. It's advantageous for you to be wise. So in similar ways, which is it's, it's interesting to hear him talk like this, but in similar ways that a big bank account, a big savings account makes you feel secure and safe because if disaster comes, you can afford it. He says wisdom is similar to that. But then we remember we saw just last week that money doesn't satisfy and a venture into money can take it all away anyway. So then he says that wisdom gives life. It preserves the life of him who has it. The advantage of knowledge, the advantage of wisdom, he says, is that even if your money fails you, your wisdom will stay with you. It teaches you to live life in such a way that maximizes true joy by enjoying God's good gifts. Now, now that he's shown us what is best and that it's good. Again, we, we didn't know what's best, but we do know what's better. Wisdom is better than folly. He wraps up, and this will be our conclusion. Point three, joy is found in the sovereignty of God. Now, I want you all to go back with me to the main point. What do we say? We do not know what is best for us. Therefore, we should live with wisdom and joy while trusting in the sovereign God who does. The preacher closes our text by giving two considerations we must take in response to all of this. Verse 13, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? So he says, in light of all this, you don't know what's best. God does. You do here live with wisdom. But just consider, can you straighten up anything that God has allowed to go crooked or cause to go crooked? He's going to put us back in our place. Remember, he's over the sun. We're under the sun. This world, because of Genesis 3, is broken. And so if it's broken and the sovereign God is overseeing that brokenness, can you tell him how to do his job any better? Can you straighten up what his sovereign rule and care is doing on the planet? No. And so then he says, consideration number two in the climactic point of all of our sermon today. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Now that last phrase, friends, does it sound familiar? That man not, might not be able to know what is after him, find out anything after him. Remember our question in point one that, that from chapter six, verse 12? Who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Right? We answered, who knows what's best? And the answer was, not you, not me, not us. Now he brings that same phrase back so that we'll say, not you, not me, not us, but God does. We don't know what's best, but he does. He is the one who knows what's best. The preacher gives us the answer. And so he says, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. So if you're prospering today, he says, be joyful. Enjoy the prospering that God has given to you. But he says, but in the day of adversity, consider this. The same God who gives prosperity is the God over your adversity. So be joyful in prosperity. But then the implication is be joyful in even adversity. The same good gift-giving God is the God who's sovereign of your good days and over your bad days. Now, just, just to be very clear, many of you are suffering in ways that it's like, how can that be fair? Like, how can, how can I rejoice and be joyful in this kind of suffering? How could he say that to me? Now, let me just click on a few things. Your suffering could be, uh, one, because of somebody else's wickedness. Someone's harmed you. Someone's hurt you. It's someone else's sin against you, and that's why you're suffering. It could be just because we live in a broken world. So you have cancer, you have sickness, or you're worried about a test to find out if you're sick. 
And so we live in a broken world. Our bodies fail us. Things go wrong. People run through red lights and hit us. People get sick. People die. Things shock us. The power goes out on Sunday morning when you finish your sermon. Like those kind of things happen in a broken world. Right? So your suffering might be it's a broken world. Or your suffering might be because of Satan. Friends, we fight a spiritual battle. It's what Ephesians 6 tells us. That there's an invisible spiritual realm that is attacking and warring against us. Or your suffering might be because of your own personal sin. You might be suffering because you're dealing with repercussions of your own sin. But here's the good news. God is sovereign over all. So in the day of prosperity or in the day of adversity, you can find joy in the one who's holding, holding it all together. We do not know what is best for us. And I can tell you right now, any Christian I've ever met who's worth their salt will tell you, I learned the most about God and I grew in my relationship with God, not at the peaks, but in the valleys. And so I can rejoice and find joy in my prosperity, but I can find it in the valleys because I know my good God is a sovereign God over all things. None of this happened off his watch. He's not surprised by any of it. He's with me. He's growing me closer to him. And in the end, when I get to the end, the end will be better than the current. And I know that. And so I can rejoice in adversity or in prosperity. And this is especially true as Christians, right? We know that our greatest suffering has already been taken care of. The worst thing that could ever happen to you is to sit under the wrath of God for your sin. And if you're in Christ, it's already happened to you. And you went into the grave with Christ and you resurrected with Christ. Not because of any good you've done, but because of all the good he did. And through repentance and faith, the worst thing that could ever happen to you has already happened to you. And therefore, your future is infinitely beautiful. Because you'll be with the resurrected king forever. And so we conclude this morning by reading some of the most precious words ever written from Ho in, in Holy Scripture anywhere in the world. Romans chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles, you can flip there with me. It'll be on the screen. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. The Apostle Paul. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who su subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage, corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God, according to adversity and according to prosperity for you. The Holy Spirit is praying for you right now. And we know that for those who love God, all things, all things, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, all things, we don't know what's best. We don't know what's good. God does. And he says, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. If you're in Christ, if you've been justified, you will be glorified. Take it to the bank. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also not with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. He's over the sun right now. He's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Not only is the Spirit praying for you, the Son of God is at the right hand of God, over the sun, praying for us right now. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, 
nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just worship you in response to the fact that we do not know what's best and we confess that to you. I pray for non-Christians in the room that they would be convicted to their core right now and confess, I do not know what's best for my life. As your children, we say it to you. We think we know what's best and we ask you to forgive us when we're so arrogant and ignorant to argue with you because we think we know what's best. But we confess we don't know what's best. We also confess that you've given us wisdom in your word. We know what's better than what's worse. We know how to live according to wisdom. We, we, we have your scriptures. We know what it looks like to live a wise and godly life. You've given us Proverbs. You've given us passages of other Proverbs all throughout the scriptures. Jesus, you are wisdom made flesh. You've taught us we have your word, and so often we neglect it. And we live unwise lives because we don't read your word. And we don't read your word. We don't do what you say because we don't trust what you say. Forgive us, God. Pray for non-Christians in the room that, they, room that they would realize they're trusting in somebody's words, either their own words, their professors' or teachers' words, words they hear on songs or in secular uh, just movies. or what, like They're trusting somebody's message about life. I pray they would see the, the folly of that. I pray that as Christians we would see the folly of trusting in any other words besides your words for wisdom. But God, we thank you most and we find joy in you. That you're a good God who came and got us. You lived for us, you died for us, you rose for us. Your spirit now is praying for us with groanings too deep for words. The Lord Jesus is interceding us at, us at your right hand praying for us. And you know what's good. You work all things together for good for those who are called according to your purpose, which is to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus. And so whether it's in prosperity or adversity, we know you work all things out to conform us to the image of your son until we go to glory to be with him forever. So make us more faithful. Help us to be people who live with wisdom and joy while trusting in the sovereign God over all things.